All right, uh, greetings. It is October the 2nd, 2012. Uh, this is Thomas Keegan with LibertarianProgressive.com. We're interviewing uh, Jim Clotter today. Uh, no party affiliation for the U.S. House District 4 out of Florida. And we're interviewing independent third-party candidates. That's what we've been doing um, this year. And uh, on our website, LibertarianProgressive.com, is where you'll find independent third-party candidates who are going to be on the ballot for the U.S. Congress and who um, are independent third-party candidates. Basically, we want you to read the full contract before signing on it. So, I, I mean, um, you know, if you only read uh, two-thirds of a very important contract, would you sign it? Um, if that, you know, just hoping that other one-third might be, uh, you know, something you don't need to know. Um, it's the same thing with picking Republicans and Democrats. And actually, Jim is um, running against Andrew Crenshaw, uh, incumbent Republican. Um, there really is no other, there's not even, I don't see a Democrats in this district. So, I mean, here, I mean, would you read, you know, sign the contract if you only read half of it um, without reading the other half, which would be um, uh, James Clowder here, or Jim, um, which actually you can read more about him at um, Clowder, K-L-A-U-D-E-R, the number four, congress.com. And, um, and so, Jim, it's a pleasure. Thank you for doing this interview, helping us um, get some more information uh, out to the public, um, so there, you know, so this democracy can be one that is um, uh, of a fully informed or, or an informed and educated public. And please tell us a little bit about yourself, what got you motivated, um, a brief bio, and uh, and. Um, yeah, and a brief bio, what got you motivated, and a little bit about your district uh, number four um, this year, Jim, and thank you for joining us today. Well, and thank you for this opportunity to uh, chat with you, and hopefully this gets out to a lot of people who might be interested in uh, not only my district, but you know, every, every member of Congress has a vote, and wherever you live in the United States, you're going to be affected by that person, so... Uh, even if you live in Colorado or California or Washington State, wherever you are, you ought to take an interest in candidates, wherever they are, who resonate with you. Because if you support those candidates, help them get elected, you have a better chance of having your views uh, changed into uh, policy or affect the way Congress operates. But in any case, yeah, yeah, you asked some questions and I'm happy to, uh, to answer. My, my background is uh, in economic education. I actually went to Princeton University a long time ago. Uh, out of Princeton, went into the Navy. I was an officer in the U.S. Navy for a while, went to Vietnam for a year. And then I, I got out and I went into business for myself. I opened a an insurance agency, and it was a very profitable and, and great business to run. And while I was doing it, I got to know a lot of people in the community where I live, and I got myself elected as a county commissioner. This was in the state of Washington, the uh, absolute other end of the country from where I am now in Florida. But uh, I served for two terms as a county commissioner uh, in San Juan County in the state of Washington, and uh, loved politics. and. You know, once I think you uh, you start shooting politics up, you uh, you mainline it, you're hooked forever. In any case, uh, what got me involved in this race here in Florida, and I've lived in Florida for uh, almost ten years, is I would uh, I would sit down to dinner every night. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd watch the news. You know, I'd watch uh, CNN or, or ABC or, or some version of the news, and I would uh, sit down to dinner and I would just rail at my wife because of what I just heard happening on the news in Congress. And the, uh, the day that Andrew Crenshaw, he's our congressman here, he's been in Congress for 10 years and he's been in the state government for 10 years before that. So he's pretty much a lifer, uh, career politician uh, type. And he, the, the day that he voted to increase the debt ceiling by $2.4 trillion, that was back in August last year. That was the, the package to uh, take care of the debt at that time. They raised the ceiling $2.4 trillion. Well, I think I must have gone a little ballistic at dinner that night because uh, I, must, I must have gone over the top because my wife, she's 
she sort of said, you know, time out, Jim, time out. You know, every night, every night's the same thing. You think Congress is dysfunctional. You think they're doing the wrong thing. And you know what you need to do? You need to roll up your sleeves and do something about it or shut up. Well, you know, they sh that shut me up for that dinner. But uh, I got to thinking about it. And about a week later, I, I went back to my wife and I said, you know, sweetheart, you need to be careful what you say to me because you've planted the seed in the back of my mind and I can't, I can't get rid of it. It's growing like a weed back there. And and she knew, you know, that I was involved in politics before. She knows I like that kind of stuff. And she said, well, I was absolutely serious. I'm dead serious. I think you've got it in you to want to do this and you're not going to be happy unless you do it. And I, with uh, Congress's approval rating floating around uh, 12 or 13 <laughs> percent, you know, take a shot at it. What do you got to lose? Yeah. So it got, it got me to thinking, and I uh, I actually, I've, I've been a registered Republican pretty much all my life. I'm, I'm pretty conservative. I'm actually probably a libertarian more than I am a Republican. But uh, I I just, there's two ways to get on the ballot here in Florida. You can either write a check for $10,400, or you can go out and collect 3,000 but. Uh, ballot petition signatures. So I, in August, uh, after this uh, debt ceiling increase, and, and Andrew voted for the bailout of the banks, you know, $750 billion New York City Wall Street bailout so the bankers up there could keep their bonuses. And the uh, campaign contributions flowed freely into his uh, campaign account after that vote. But... In any case, I decided if I couldn't go out and get 3,000 petitions signed to get on the ballot, then it really wasn't worth running at all, because if there weren't 3,000 people just as irate as I was, or dissatisfied with Congress, what was the point of running? Well, it turns out it was very easy to get those ballot signatures. The only problem was there were two other Republicans who were out collecting ballot petitions, and that made three of us who had qualified to challenge the incumbent. Now, Crenshaw had $800,000 in his campaign account left, left over right from his 2010 campaign. I'm sure he could make one phone call and double it if he thought he needed it. But here we're going to be three challengers up against a well-funded incumbent with name recognition up the wazoo. And I thought if the three of us all ran uh, against him, we would just take whatever displeasure there was with him and disperse it three ways, and he gets an easy win. So... I uh, I chose to skip the primary, and Andrew went ahead and won the primary in earlier this year in August, and skipped the primary to go straight to the general election where I'm running as an independent. And really, I, I think the uh, the issue here is that every two years, voters get to, to make a judgment about the effectiveness of their representative. And it, it seems obvious to me, and, and of course everybody I talk to who's paying any attention, the Congress is absolutely dysfunctional and self-serving. And the members of Congress are not dealing with the serious issues that we face. They're very, very good at kicking the can down the road, but they don't seem to be very good at solving problems. And to me... Yeah, they're good at they're spending money. I mean, I, I mean well, I'm good at spending money, too, if you yeah. want me to be, you know. Well, that's the overriding issue in this election is the national debt. I mean, they're not good at spending it. They're good at wasting it, I, I should say. I yeah. mean, they're not good at investing it. I mean, whose debt do they raise? They raised. Um, they didn't raise their own debt. I mean, if, if a certain congressperson, you know, got themselves a credit card or something, that'd be a different story. But they, I mean, the debt ceiling's been raised so many times, an equal amount from, you know, pretty much Republicans and Democrats um, over the last, you know, couple of decades. And... Uh, they, they, what they did was raise the debt. They put us under more debt. I, I mean, so just imagine now. I mean, Jim, like bef uh, before that dinner started. I mean, you're mad because your debt got increased. I mean, each of us has a certain amount that um, you know could be split up between all of us. And well, um, that, that to me is the overriding issue. Yeah, this, we're, they're adding a, like a season. house payment to us. It's yeah. sixteen trillion dollars right now, and federal spending is. Uh, absolutely out of control and for the past three years uh, Andrew Crenshaw has been voting for the ever increasing appropriation bills that are driving the debt higher at the rate of a hundred billion dollars a month right now we owe 40 we borrow 
41, 45 cents out of every dollar Washington spends. And it's just simply not sustainable. It's just, I mean, it's got to stop. You don't have to be in line for a Nobel Prize in economics to understand the dynamics of that sort of debt. And well, it's estimated the population of the United States, I'm, I'm at um, some website right now, is 313 million. I guess it seems like that's declined a little bit. But anyways, it says each citizen's share of this debt is $51,277 if it's $16 trillion. And uh, so, yeah, they, they're putting 50, and, and you know, some people don't even, you know, make that much and stuff like that. And um, so, the, and what are we getting for it? Um, I mean, it's, 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 it's we're getting um, higher payments, reduced um, value of our dollars um, into more wars, empire spending, corporate welfare, uh, bailouts. Um, and he is also... An inter- is this an interview of you or me? <laughs> yeah, well, just crystallizing what you said, um, you, you know, that's a very important point. I, I mean, I just had that image when, um, y- you know, <laughs> when you're mad about that uh, debt ceiling increase. Well, the problem is with uh, the guy I'm running against, Andrew Crenshaw, he's uh, been in Congress for 11 years, and he's voted to increase the debt ceiling six times. That's what, you know, and they're going to have to do it again before the end of the year. So, you know, the, the list of his sort of, he's a disaster on fiscal issues, and that is going to sink our country. I mean, it's going to take the future away from anybody that looks down the road and looks for the opportunities that, that I had when I was growing up. Uh, they're, they're just not going to be there because they're going to be under this mountain of debt that uh, and, and there's only I, I guess a couple of ways they can deal with it. We can inflate our way out of it and do what Germany did after World War One, and just simply pay people back with um, dollars that are worthless. And we just say to China, well, that, here's, "Here's a piece of paper that has 16 zeros on it, and it, it's it's worth 16 billion trillion dollars." I mean, what are they going to say? <laughs> yeah, and that didn't end up too good either. Um, because people got really desperate, and um, and the people Absolutely. had decided not to vote, um, you, you know, got overrun by the Nazi party, and um, so okay. uh, we, we don't want to do either of those things. Um, one thing I noticed I, here is um, your opponent um, voted for the uh, National Defense Authorization Act, which I see here on your platform here violates two of those things. Um, heeding to the Constitution, protecting liberty, and valuing human life, and also um, it also uh, objected to um, uh, adding uh, things onto um, uh, bills that don't have anything to do with them. I mean, there's two provisions to that National Defense Authorization Act, and I'd like to ask you your take on that, and then we'll also go to like the whole military and foreign policy as well, um, because well, the, that has a lot. Just the end, yeah. the national. Uh, authorization of military that that act was there are provisions in there that are the scariest things I've ever read in federal legislation they actually have the right right now it's passed into the law to come snatch somebody out of their house in the middle of the night put a bag over their head take them away and not charge them with anything not tell anybody else where they are put them in incommunicado and hold them indefinitely for no reason that they tell that person and that that person is unable to contact anybody on the outside to even tell them they need help or where they are or anything else. I mean, that is just, you can just snatch somebody in the middle of the night without charging them, without a warrant, without, I mean, this is just, it, lawlessness. You don't, you don't even know how to describe that. I mean, I don't know if the Nazis were that bad. I mean, maybe they were. Stalin was, I'm sure he was that bad, but that's where we, that's where we're headed with this this act written the way it is it's in the law and it's just it's got to be repealed it's just wrong and it's, it violates the constitution all over the place actually and i heard a lot of our military were against it i mean some of the generals spoke up and said we don't need this and we don't want it you know and they still passed it anyways um these people yeah. who have 10 percent a 10 percent approval rating now like you said this budget is a very serious thing i, I mean it's a huge magnitude how do we deal with that it, does the military spending have anything to do with that um and, absolutely you know. yeah absolutely I, you know i was in the military and i happened to be a supply officer in the navy and it, I, and I was on a brand new ship. I was assigned to a brand new ship, and I'd been on a, on board for two or three months. And 
I mean, this ship was straight out of Avondale shipyards. Put, everything was working well. We, our lockers were full of everything we could stuff into them. And we were headed across the Atlantic, and we got a, a message from the commander of the Atlantic fleet. I remember standing at the, with the executive officer in the evening just before we went to dinner. The department heads would all meet each night, you know, and sort of review the day and get the standing orders for tomorrow and, you know, report any incidents. It's just a kind of a checking kind of operation. And the XO handed me this message, and it said that we had to sp spend $800,000 in the next two weeks on supplies. And I looked at it and there was nothing we needed. We couldn't spend $800,000 on supplies. And I looked at him and I told him that. And he says, I'll tell you what, uh, Mr. Clauder, why don't you go up and after dinner and see the captain? He'll probably be up on the bridge. Uh, we were steaming across the Atlantic. The captain always had a cup of coffee after dinner up on the bridge. So after dinner, I went up there and I went up to the captain and I said, excuse me, sir, can I, have a word? Absolutely. What's on your mind? What? And I showed him this message, and I said, there's no way we can spend $800,000. He looked at me, and he just smiled. He says, yeah, that's not a suggestion. Well, that's, um, I mean, so we need audit. Well, it seems like there's a lot of incentives. I mean, when, when you're forced to do things like that, a lot of departments are incentivized to increase their they had budgets. To use up, they had to use up their quota. They, they leave 10%, you know, sitting aside until the last two weeks of the uh, the fiscal year. Do we need legislation to, like, um, turn that around, um, do you think? You know, they're, they're just through throughout the whole federal government. I mean, there's whole departments that I think you could get rid of. The Department of Education centralized control of, of schools in Washington. I think that ought to just be abolished. And yeah, the, well, uh, about, about 11 Control cents. of schools ought to be back at a, lo uh, at a local level. But with the military, I mean, for, for one thing, you can start bringing troops home, bring them home from the wars, which seem to me, well, take, for instance, the Afghan war. From my take on that is that if we had um, if we had left Afghanistan two years ago, we would have left behind a Muslim tribal-based society, and they would have worked it out on their own. If we leave tomorrow, we'll leave behind a Muslim tribal-based society, and they'll work it out on their own. If we leave two years from now, we'll leave behind a Muslim right, tribal-based society, points. Yeah. And, they'll, <laughs> and they'll work it out on their own. So meanwhile, we spend $10 billion a month to be there. And you say, to what purpose? Right, is Not that the mention, best? Of course, the human toll and the waste of resources. But Absolutely. it's just, it's just, there's changes in foreign policy like that. And bringing the, you know, do we need to really guard the eastern border of Germany for yeah. them against the, <laughs> the Soviet menace? Do we really need to be, a, you know, South Korea is a very prosperous country. They've got a lot of big standing army. We really need to be guarding the border. So I think I see what you're saying. You're kind of like thinking of us more as a republic instead of an empire, I guess, or, or um, the relics. We're not really an empire as, as such, but, I mean, we're positioning ourselves to be one, for sure. If someone was looking from above and just observing objectively, it seems like. Um, and, and a republic's a lot cheaper to maintain, isn't it? Well, there's incredible savings to be had just if you decide that you're going to have a national defense not a national offense. Well, that's a good point. And so that that's a major part of the budget. Also, there is like Absolutely. the three main things. Um, and like you said, it goes throughout all the departments where they have that incentive. Um, and education, I mean, we, re we really only get 11 cents or 11 percent of uh, so, like goes to education f from the federal government. So it's not like the states can handle it. Most of the education comes from property taxes, I think, and lotteries and things like that. And, uh, well, but it's still, you know, 70 billion is 70 billion, and you start taking 70 billion here and 70 billion there, and you know, pretty soon you, 
you know, you're making a dent in things. No, I'm saying, yeah, and, 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 and it's probably something that, you know, people wouldn't really miss uh, too much either. And um, and there's so many things that we can do with education. Um, I mean, there's so many experimental schools out there trying different things. 50 Laboratories of Freedom, I mean, you, you know, we would get some really awesome results um, from from some of those 50 states, and then they could be emulated. And uh, Absolutely, yep. That's the beauty of having different states with uh, have, having state control over what they do because you get these little experiments being run on a state level basis and the things that really work will spread and the things that don't work will die. Yeah, and out of 50, I mean, I'm sure there'll be like, a, you know, at least like five like really awesome awesome things that everyone yeah, can learn from absolutely yeah, and uh and, and and at the same time with that state um laboratory type of thing um you know people still do have equal rights under the law that's what the constitution's there that's the main reason why everyone you know agreed to come together and form the constitution in the first place well it'd be nice if we would uh if the legislators would, every time they go to look to look at a law, is first of all say, is this really necessary? And put it through that test rather than, you know, is, is some special interest paying for this and am I going to get a con uh, campaign contribution out of it? That's, it seems to me the latter is what's going on in Congress. It's, most of what happens there is being driven by special interests. And it's... Um, it's distorting and perverting the whole political process. Yeah, will it expand freedom or, or, or lessen it, and at what cost, um, if, if it's necessary? And um, so um, what about Social Security, Medicare? Those seem to be the two big issues. Um, you know, do you have any tweaks you would do to that, any proposals, or which way would you lean as far as, um, you know, uh, our budgeting with Social Security, Medicare, and, and just taxes in general? Yeah. Um, Social Security. I think for those people who worked their whole life and had to pay into a government-mandated savings system, they didn't have a choice. They were forced to take some of their, their earnings, and the company they worked for put it in on top of it. They had to take their earnings and put it into that savings system. That's a contract with the government, and they are due that repayment of the benefits that they were promised when they were uh, paying in. I really don't think you can do anything with those folks. They're entitled to that Social Security. The government can't just unilaterally uh, break that agreement, break that contract, uh, and say, well, we're walking away from you or we're changing the terms or we're going to... So I think you got to leave the folks that are getting Social Security alone. I don't think you can touch their benefits. But for the younger generations on down, people who aren't retired yet, and I don't know where you draw the line, perhaps as part of the political compromising process to, to figure that out, and maybe the actuar actuarials can help define where those lines are that'll make the process solvent. But somewhere down the line in the younger generations, you have to change the rules a little bit and uh, tell them it's not gonna be quite the same as what their, their grandfather, grandmother got. Like raising the I mean, age limit or something? Yeah, like yeah, something, yeah, the retirement age and, and that sort of thing. Well, what about the but, Obamacare um, or Romney care? As you know, you know, what do you think? <laughs> would you vote against that? And, and what? Yeah, would, you yeah, know, I, what would, I would. And yeah. I, I would vote against it. And, and the, the real problem with medicine in general is the size of the government, in, the federal government's involvement in it. The, the federal government is such a big player and the way that it defines rules and sets up procedures and everything else about how the system works, they distort the market. And when you distort the market, you're going to get very odd outcomes, outcomes that you don't want. And certainly we've seen increasing costs that you don't want. It stifles competition. It doesn't allow you know private insurers to, to, to carve out niche markets, and it doesn't allow... Uh, specialty providers to... Well, to, do you think it, to, it, 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 it's, it's a competition killer? Do you think it, the people who are benefiting are the big conglomerate insurance companies that... Um, do you think there's like a revolving door in Washington that needs to be uh, Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's the biggest business 
<laughs> or I, I guess second to the military industrial complex, it's the second biggest business in town. And so the big hospital chains, uh, they're all kind of into it. Uh, the pharmaceutical companies are into it. And uh, they're all setting up things that seem to to benefit them at so the you're going to investigate the, the that. of the whole yeah. system. You're going to call people like that out. You're going to investigate it. Um, you know, do you, do you believe in tra – do you think we're stronger the more the public is informed and educated, and, and that way people can make more informed decisions? Um, and so do you plan on bringing some of that Florida, you know, s sunlight to Congress, <laughs> to Washington? Well, you know what? I'll tell you what. One thing that's discouraging about running for office is – I can walk up to 10 people in the course of uh, an hour, and three or four of them will say, I don't vote. Two or three of the, uh, two or three more will say, um, you know what, I, I don't have time right now to, to talk to you. I mean, they just are not engaged, and it's really a relatively few who, I'm not talking one or two out of 10, that really take an interest or are informed and even some of them it's only on a very superficial level i mean they'll think in terms of oh yeah i'm for obamacare not really knowing too much about it other than the fact that obama uh, sponsored it or they'll say they're uh, you're they're against it because they've heard some republicans rail against it i mean they, they don't they're the depth of detailed knowledge doesn't go really deep it's only the the junkies, I guess, like me, people running for office and the policy walks. Well, that, we got to convince them that, I mean, politics is just all it is, is about people. So if they believe, based, most people would probably say that they think people should be able to do what they want as long as they don't hurt others and, um, and, and they believe in honesty. So they're already involved in politics. If they don't vote, they're actually voting for the Republican or a Democrat. They're voting for the status quo. I mean, I, I know, you know, yeah. some people might protest, but I mean, think about the Nazis um, in history um, and, and the Soviets and etc. I mean, there's a lot of people that probably didn't vote and during those days because it took them like 10 years to creep up into the systems. And um, uh, you don't have to vote for a Republican or a Democrat. There are alternative choices in 70 percent of the country um and uh like you said i mean if if someone's from um new york or kansas or wherever um this you know these are issues uh that have to do with our co constitutional foundation and our budgets and our standard of living and um just in the integrity of our um our, you know representative republic and um now i do want to ask you real quick on two kind of um subjects that uh, a lot of politicians try to avoid and, and then just ask you in closing and, and well there's one other question after that but it, if there's anything that you wanted to also mention any issues that you'd like to bring up but um i'll throw in abortion and uh and, and the drug war and then and then please um add on any other issues that you'd like to mention jim thanks um abortion has not been an issue uh so far as I can tell here in this district, it, I mean, I, I think abortion personally is an abomination, and I I think it's a, it's a crime against the fetus, and so I'm, I'm not in favor of it in any shape or form. I mean, that's just a personal belief. I, I'm a little bit lean towards Ron Paul's uh, view, though, that it's maybe an issue that is best kept between uh, a patient and a physician and that the federal government really isn't the the person to decide that issue. If it's if it's anything, it might be a state's rights issue, but I don't think it's a federal issue, and I don't think it should really come into play there. But, I mean, that's just a personal feeling of mine. In terms of the drug war, that's a war that's been going on for 25 years, and it's an abysmal failure. I mean, a total failure. It's easier for a kid. I live um, a block away from our high school in town where I live. And it's easier for a kid in high school to go buy a joint than it is for that kid to buy a cigarette. It just, it's just amazing to me. That's the reality of the drug war. Uh, it's just, and then there, the solution, the federal solution to it is when it's not working just to throw more money at it. And that's just a failure too. So I look at the, kind of the whole drug scene, especially marijuana, as kind of a, 
one example and think if it's so ubiquitous i mean if everybody's doing it uh maybe we ought to tax it i mean there's a huge huge business going on in this country and we're looking we're going broke uh, we're going over a fiscal cliff we don't have we you know borrow 45 cents out of every dollar we spend if we need money you know there's one easy way to to something to tax that is certainly in use and people are paying a lot of money for in this country so i mean i i think uh, we ought to be taking a look at the idea of uh, taxing. Yeah, it's on par uh, at less least with marijuana. alcohol. I mean, it's it's definitely not any more destructive than alcohol. Arguably less. Um, there's we have the highest incarceration rate right now. We are wasting lots of money and um, and also splitting up you, you know families of a lot of people who are in there for victimless crimes. Um, and uh, any other issues that you'd like to uh, touch on, Jim? Yeah, well, it taxes. I mean, I I think one of the things is perverting kind of. Um, the ability for for people to want to go out and try and create businesses, uh, entrepreneurs to be uh, inventive, and all, all of that area of commerce is, I think, stifled under a dark cloud of regulation. So we need to get government out of the way in so many aspects of people's lives. Uh, and so doing away with a lot of regulation, I think, would help, but also the uh, issue of taxes the the tax code and the the permits and fees and things that you have to go through in order to start a business are so onerous and i don't think we need to revise the tax code i think we need to replace it with a with a uh, just a like we have in florida we have a sales tax do you think just a national sales tax with with no income tax i mean no 999 nonsense um, yeah i don't know whether it's 999 or if it's the fair tax or some form of flat tax i mean i just know it's got what we've got is you know how many thousands of pages uh, thick now of tax code and they're all littered littered with special interest provisions yeah it's it's to help monopolies basically a lot of these regulations are just um put there to keep on um, monopolies and and power um we need to toss the whole thing and i think start with a clean slate and make it really really simple and really i mean i i envision people doing their taxes on the back of a postcard yeah yeah that would be nice um yeah that would be really nice i, I mean it, it, well, a lot of things to consider there. Um, who's some of um, someone that you've been? Um, oh, and I forgot. Also, just closing, if you could describe the fourth district a little bit. And um, our last question here is: Who's someone that's been on your mind as you've been going through this um, um, election this year? Um, anyone you've been reading about? Anyone you've been thinking about? You, you know, someone that's been on your mind. And if you wouldn't mind sharing with us that um, person or persons and and why, Jim. Thanks. Uh, yeah, the a couple of people that I, I like reading Hayek, uh, the economist, uh, who wrote a book called Road to Serfdom, because I think we're on it, and he describes perfectly what happens when you get centralized planning taking over for individual freedoms, and I, I fear actually social chaos in this country if we don't turn this thing around quickly. Yeah, that's uh, uh, he's he's a he's a major influence in kind of the way I think, um, and and Rand isn't far behind. Cool. On for him. <laughs> cool. Well, they, uh, well but and, I, yeah, the, go ahead. The, to uh, describe, you know, you, you asked about the fourth congressional. It's the very northeast corner of Florida. It's uh, Jacksonville is the major city, and has the bulk of the population is uh, in the Jacksonville area. So it's uh, it's primarily a Republican district. It always has been electing Republicans out of this district to uh, statewide and federal offices. So it's, but, you know, with, with the approval rating of Congress where it is, and Republicans in this district are fairly conservative, and I think there's going to be a revolt against Andrew Crenshaw because he's, he's he votes the wrong way on fiscal issues, and a lot of conservatives here in this district are fed up with it. Yeah, he's asking, I mean, the whole Congress is asking for it. They do have a 10% approval rating with the Gallup poll. 
um, and uh, they, they hit that mark twice this year um, in March and in August 24th and um, so uh, let's give it to them let's give it to them and um, yeah I hope you spread your message wide and far in, in the 4th District and, and people around the country see this as kind of a national campaign so it doesn't matter where you're at in Wisconsin or, or where, wherever you may be in, in the 4th District in Florida I'm looking at who's going to be the best choice who's going to best represent me that's why I'm voting this is um, you know this is not something you have to pay for uh, to, to, to be involved uh, you can spread the message hey, listen, you, can vote. Tell, you know tell, tell everybody that uh, watches this video or, or hears this to uh, send 25 bucks <laughs> we need it yeah. We're running on. We're running on empty. Believe me. Well, s send all you can, and and uh, <laughs> and I mean, ba basically, uh, I mean, there's two choices. There's the Constitution, or there's the uh, the, the the 10 percent approval rating of Congress. And if we really had a Congress that reflected that 10 percent rating, I mean, there should only be about 10 percent Democrats and Republicans in there. Now, I mean, maybe we could get. What if we even got 10 independents? I mean, someone who's going to, um, you know, pretty much much do what you have on your platform here it's it's a night and day difference it's a it's a difference it would, between, shake, th it would uh, shake things up it would really shake things up yeah it would it would be a political um revolution it would be a shot heard around the world it would reinvigorate all those people that um you know still believe in the constitution that who are independents who are you know put america first um who might not agree on everything but uh you know, who put America first and the Constitution first and sincerely want to keep our uh, constitutional rights. And, um, and and a lot of this um, situation that we're in, it's just plain and simple corruption. I mean, it just get rid of yeah, a lot of that that's corruption. That's at the heart of it. And that, that's at the heart of it. That's, that's the heart of it. And um, so uh, we're, we're going to see on you a, de a, a debate soon or, or anything like that? Is, um, uh, no, my gosh, no. He, he doesn't want to even acknowledge that I exist. Well, um, I'd say, you know, let's get him a, a real job. He doesn't want to acknowledge that we exist, uh, with that we the That's people. Right. And uh, this couldn't be a more opportune time. You are in position, Jim, uh, to, um, you, you know, be, be the uh, voice of the people, to be the path that um, uh, freedom and, and uh, constitutional law flows through uh, the, and uh, the, of least resistance. It's definitely not through. You, you, know what, you know what I sort of really hope is that, Somebody like me, me. I, I mean, I hope it's me, and we're working hard to, to make it happen. But if it's not me, other people like me who don't have a whole lot of money but went out to visit with all the people in the district at all corners of the district and in every parking lot, talked to everybody, and for one reason or another got elected to office and... That and show the system. I mean, that would shake up Washington more than anything else. If somebody can can win a race with fifty thousand dollars, oh yeah, and they were that's running that, against somebody with eight hundred thousand dollars, that would really rock the boat in Washington because it would start saying to the special interest people, "Wait a second, maybe we can't just buy every election." Yeah, our constitution's not for sale, and um, and I think people deep down know that. So, I mean, it's just in their blood and in their spirits um and uh, it, that's why we, we if you want to know 50 people and also resources to find people in your district i mean that's libertarianprogressive.com we have interviews like this uh, 50 people and jim uh, it's been a pleasure i hope to see you um in, in the congress uh, uh sworn in again to protect the oath and uh and to uphold the constitution and um uh, i'm looking well, forward to that well, um, I know you got to go. I'll uh, I'll say goodbye to you real quick after this interview. Thanks for your time today, Jim. And thank you very much for your time, and I uh, appreciate what you are doing because uh, it takes all of us sort of playing the role that we can play, and you're playing an important role. Yeah, this is real journalism here. I mean, we're giving yep. you the news that you might not always get uh, from yep. the main networks. And, um, again, it's K-L-A-U-D-E-R-4, the number 4, congress.com. And, um, all right, Jim, well, have an excellent afternoon and, and uh, you know, um, successful campaigning, sir. Thanks. Thank you. And all the best to you, too.